Hi, it's Genji UK here again, back for part two of the Prelude, the Zora 2 Replica Rev 1.1. It was originally manufactured by ACT, yeah, hardware designed by Thomas Wenzel, recreated by ALF 24D 2022. So if you saw part one, there's a few different versions, this is the short version. I think the same guys were involved in that, and then there's the long version, and this replicates the original Prelude from ACT back in uh, 1997. If you want to see the half height one, check out Wrangler Amiga. As I mentioned in the previous video, there'll be a link down below to that. He's got one in his A3000++ machine. So I'm going to start by just cleaning up here, flying through this with cotton buds, and then use toothbrush. But I guess if you're just joining us now, it might be worth checking out part one. We've got some parts here, got some caps and things to fit on here. This is the MPEG module, so it'll, you know, play MP3 files. It did cross my mind that the IC that's on here I might be able to use that to fix the CD32 FMV module. I don't know. There might be some translation or something needed in, you know, in between. Anyway, we'll uh, pick up with those things in a minute, and I've got some other parts arriving as well. And of course, we need to test out the MPEG side, test more of the AHI side. I'm going to add some more IPA there. Yeah, look, I can barely even do a third of it. Let's just get some more IPA in there. Make sure the heat is not on. doing this old thing again, this thing. Yeah, it's not working. Right, that was painful to clean. It really was, if you have a look at the top of it now. It's pristine. There's a little bit of flux or something there, actually, with a bit of IPA. I'll wipe that off. I forgot to clean the solder points there, but the ultrasonic dealt with that. And then on the underside, as you can see, it looks pretty darn good, actually. Looks amazing. Yeah, don't go too overboard when wiping gold contacts like this, this Enig stuff, because you, you do still get some coating off, you know, it comes off just with a bit of a rub. So yeah, there was that little bit there, wasn't there? Uh, yeah, so that's looking absolutely immaculate. There's a scratch there, it had that when it came. So, yeah, I'm not worried about that. It's obviously a manufacturer thing. So, that's that done, finally. We've also got a new plate that came from Glenn over at CRG. It's 3D printed a plate. In fact, he's 3D printed me two plates. He's 3D printed a plate for the card that he sent me that's going to be another video. Yeah, so that's the one for this because it's got all of these little round points there. So he's even put the screws in and everything. That's nicely printed that, isn't it? It's really precision. There's a little pattern there, but I mean, it's not a big deal. You could always spray something like that as well. If you get any imperfections in 3D printed surfaces, you know, you could f smooth it down and then uh, paint over it, but that's pretty good and it seems pretty flexible. So that's gonna do the job. And it's gonna go like that, isn't it? Could do with just taking those two screws out just to see how that fits. I'm not going to stick it on right now because it's on the bench, and when you're working on things on the bench, the last thing you want is one of these brackets on the back. So you can see everything lines up perfectly there. I'd need to take the nuts off, you know, stick this on, put the nuts on, and then put the screws through the holes there. But isn't that nice? Really nice. I love it. Thank you ever so much, Glenn, for that. The irony after spending all that time cleaning it up, I'm now going to solder on there again. I'm just going to get this four pin connector. I've got a five pin one here. I'm going to trim the one pin off. Flip it over and solder it on. So that's for the AUX, I think it's AUX 1, which is where you could join your Mega motherboard sound. This is how I think the pass through works actually. Because I was reading about it, uh, you know, uh, and Andy, uh, you know, the Wrangler guy, yeah, what's it called? Mega Wrangler. Um, he said you need to, you know, use like load module or something on boot and you, you, you run some pass through thing that gets the audio from your Amiga working. And I was like looking at the Zorro pin out, there's no audio connection. So I'm like, how does he get the audio? It's got to be from here on a 2000. Ow! On a 2000, you'd have to connect this up. But then again, he's using a 3000. I'm not sure the 3000 has 
an audio pin header like you get on the 2000, you know, the infernal serial connector sort of area where you get um, audio out of there as well, I think. It might actually be next to the serial thing, but the bottom line is you can do it on a 2000. And in actual fact, to pass the audio from the Amiga side through to this sound card, you'd perhaps want to use one of the 3.5mm jacks on the back and get maybe a dual RCA Fono into 3.5mm stereo. And perhaps use that 4-pin connector there that I just fitted for CD audio. Because if you look at the Infernal Serial connector here, there's audio in and audio out, but it's mono. So I will just clean around there with a cotton bud, because that board is looking pristine at the moment, look. It's a shame I've just put some flux on it. Anyway, that's that. Complete, I think. I don't think there's anything we're missing. So far, this video has been 99.9% .9 cleaning. <laughs> this uh, line down the board, can you see it here? Let's get this in the light. There's a line that runs right down there. And if you look at this component here, this um, zero ohm link goes right over it. Yeah, it's connecting up grounds, that's what that is, I think. I think it's like isolation between your digital ground and your analog ground, because this is obviously the audio stuff. The last thing you want is like a direct ground relationship where, you know, peaks and spikes and activity on the digital side causes you some weird and wonderful things on the uh, analog side. So yeah, I'm sure that that's what that is, and there's probably another thing, that in that ferrite there probably goes over that. Yeah, it does. So you've got a ferrite and a zero ohm link joining the grounds up there. I do question why a zero ohm link, why not another ferrite, or something else, maybe even a capacitor? I don't know, that's uh, a wee bit odd. Anyway, the, the audio quality is really good. Now you wouldn't think that from watching part one, because when I was doing that sample capture and playback it sounded terrible, but it was played through these awful speakers down here. These decrepit things, Acer speakers, so if it sounded bad in part one, that's why. So the next thing is to get all the little components onto this. I'm still waiting for the socket. I never got that cap on in the last video, so we'll do that as well. We need the 100 nanofarad caps here. Yeah, these are tiny. I might need a smaller one to try and fit in the socket, and I do have some. I've got some of those like grain assault ones. I mean, these aren't much bigger. First one I'm going to do is uh, down here, actually, C5. I think it's like half put two there, C1, C5. Yeah, so the way, there's lots of ways. You can add a bit of solder to the pad and then use hot air and get it to pull itself into position. I tend to just like bodge it towards the pad, add a bit of solder, tilt it on its side, make it go upwards to tombstone make it wobble all over the place, make it be misaligned and then get it on the board and that's actually spot on in position so I'm just going to add a tiny bit more solder to, well not more, solder to this side so that's probably too much so that's one down, uh, so there's quite a few of these, I, 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 like I say I've got the bill of materials on my phone and it's like C1, C5, C6, well C6 is under there so I'll stick a smaller one there, C5 is here Funnily enough, where that cap is, it's just sat there on its own, it just landed. Landed at C5 exactly where it needs to be. What are the odds of that? That is phenomenal. And if you want to know which components go where, or just a list of the components in general, in the GitHub repository there, if you download the zip that contains everything, there's two HTML files. One outlines all of the component placements there for, you know, the main board, and one for the MPEG it. Two now, I'll report back when all these little SMDs are on. I can show you the size difference of these, I don't know what they are, oh nothing, oh nothing <laughs> sort of size, they're probably not, probably like oh... 6.0 something or something like that, I don't know. But look at the difference. These are like a quarter of the size of those. So this is why I'm going to mount one of these, because it's going to be much lower profile between you know the ground and VCC pin. Yeah, you can just about see that cap there. So yeah, I've measured it on connectivity. It is joined between the ground and the VCC. It shouldn't interfere with the chip that's going to go there. So all these other caps and resistors are all soldered on. You could perhaps do with straightening one or two with some hot air and a bit of flux. But they're all on. All the resistors are all the same size. There's like 11 of these 5.6k ones, I think they are. And the caps are all 100 nanofarads apart from, uh, where is it? These two here, which I think were ones. And you can see they're a different size. That was a cap short in the kit. 
so we'll get the crystal on next. Yeah, the square end is here, which indicates pin one. So let's get that on. There we go. So just press it down a little bit, solder one pin, and then we'll uh, solder that one and press it. Yeah, press into it just to make sure it's nice and flat. And it is. We're going to have plenty of space here for this, it's just going to be pretty tight, but a socket will fit nicely in there. And obviously we've got the one for that there, so there's just four little notches to just raise it up ever so slightly, and you want those on the underside, so yeah, I'll do that. But I'm not going to do that until I've cleaned the IPA first. That's kind of it. We just need to use a few cotton buds here just to get into these little gaps. Look, just to collect those bits of IPA. You know what? That's not bad actually. It's not bad at all. I love the colour of this PCB. I'm glad I went with this purple rather than black. So yeah, it's just using some like rubberized sort of glue, you know, it's like you who's a brand I guess in the UK here. Pin one to the left there. So I'm just gonna position that arrow to the left, just get that like that there. You can struggle to get the chip on, in fact that's what's happened in my Discord. Pillet was saying, he said, wow these PLCCs are really tight on the pads, there's not hard anything to solder onto. Um, and that was why I said I, I used a socket for that reason wasn't just that reason but yeah it's one of the benefits you get a sock on that it's easier to solder you may think it's not going to be but once you've got the base out trust me it's not that hard with magnification as long as you've got good flux anyway you can see that that's positioned fairly centrally now just let that dry and of course the marks on top of this here may be uh, like scratches it might not actually be any residue or anything a sticky label or anything it just looks a bit suspect I don't know yeah, I think that's just how it is, actually. It's just like that with that. Yeah, I am going to stick this in there at this point. So, because we're doing that, I'm just going to just carefully wipe the sides here. Yeah, so the slant here is on the bottom left, and the pin one thing is in the middle on the left there. So that's just going to correspond with how we aligned that socket with the arrow in it, pointing to the left. So it's just to try and align it on all four sides and carefully just push straight down. That's it. Whilst waiting for that socket, I think I've seen the error in my ways here. And I think this being on the back, it sounds like a good idea if you're going to stick it in this slot, yeah, because then nothing clashes here. When it's in this slot, yeah, if you've got a really thin card, there won't be a problem, but even this card here, which is pretty short, it's pretty low profile, yeah, it, it presses against the connectors of the board, so it'll just push outwards a bit. So I actually think what I'm going to have to do is fit long pins on it, on the actual main PCB, flip this onto the other side there, and uh, mount it, sort of like, like that. But then it's still pretty wide. Yeah, those long pins should just be long enough, I think, there. And then, when it's in this slot here, as you can see, it doesn't quite reach the CPU slot. So, yeah, it is better to do it that way. I don't know whether other CPU cards would be a problem with that. But, anyway, that's what I'm intended to do, I think. So, yeah, it doesn't mean taking this off, and it doesn't mean taking that off. So, yeah, learn from my mistakes. And I, I sort of... Yeah, I was a bit unsure at the time. When I did it, I thought, oh, I'm sure there'll be more space. And yeah, I measured it up and there looked to be more space, but there isn't really. you still got a limitation here. You have to use this slot, really. If you stick it there, you can't use that slot. So uh, anyway, going to use the desolder station to do this, just to try and make this easier. <coughs> oh, God, it slipped off that then. And this is the thing that looked like that shifted literally no solder. I can see me freeing this with hot air. I've described this problem with these stations before. Really you need to switch it on 
when it gets up to temperature within a minute or so, leave it for like a whole 10 minutes before you start to use it. Yeah, so that 30 degrees has helped, but what I'm going to do is, you know, hold it on the pin, get on the pin like that, hold it like for eight, nine seconds. Maybe not eight or nine, six, five or six seconds, seven seconds maybe. Yeah, and it is removing the solder there, well, seemingly. Yeah, it's just a sock, it's a bit flimsy. So, I think you can see there, I don't think we lost any pads. That looks all right. It was traumatic though. And all self-inflicted, as I say. Yeah, so I'll just use the dissolver pump on the uh, next one. Anyway, no damage to that, and it looks pretty good. It just needs this bit of flux cleaning off here. This was one of these, uh, you know, if in doubt, do now. <laughs> and I did have doubt. When I put it on, I'm like, should I really be sticking it on this side? Uh, yeah, I think it makes more sense. And it's going to be a bit more space. Um, but that doubt, that little doubt, if you've got a doubt when you're doing something, well, there's a reason you've got that doubt. You see what I mean? If it was definitely on the right side, and I knew there was definitely no problem, I would have doubted it. So there we go. Yeah, if in doubt, do now. <laughs> is today's lesson for me. The other thing is to put it through this way, so the black bit's under there with the pins down here, which means this would be pulled in by a certain depth and then just do the soldering on this side. Could do that, it'd be a bit weird, <laughs> but when have I not done weird things on my channel? But I'll anchor two points on that socket, you can see I've cut the base out of it. Um, what I was trying to show you is if you're struggling to get it lined up with the pads, because the pads are exactly the same size as the pins. So if you get it perfectly square in the middle, there's just nothing exposed to the pad, and you're like, oh my God, that's gonna be impossible to solder. And what you do is you just diagonally offset it a little bit. So you know, you move it down a little bit and one way sideways a little bit. And then you've got like a, a slight diagonal overlap. You're probably not gonna be able to see, you might be able to see more of the copper on the PCB exposed on these areas here. Yeah, and on the top pins, they're to the side slightly. It just means that that's going to be a bit easier to solder on. Right, that's it. That was incredibly easy. The hardest bit, like I said, was just getting some alignment. And if I had it square on, there would have been nothing to solder. I wouldn't have been able to get the solder to go underneath the pin. But by just, you know, diagonally, you know, pulling it down into one corner means all four sides got a sort of alignment where there's a little bit of the trace exposed. Not a lot, but enough to get the solder to flow. And it's gone nicely there. It's gone all under, you know, and around the pin. Yeah, I think you'll agree that's not bad at all. Yeah, so in retrospect, I think that socket there is not very straight. It comes up, you know, it's, it's further away from here than it is there. But you're never going to see it anyway. Um, and the solder points here, they look perfect. So I'll get the base glued in next, get the chip in. Yeah, so I've opted to push them in this way and solder them on this side. And I need obviously the other eight here, I'll do that in a sec. But yeah, you can see, you know, we've shortened it a little bit. What I don't want to do is have to cut these down one by one and they'll all be higgledy-piggledy and look mangled. At least like this now, it's going to sit to about there. And if you look at the gap, yeah, there's a little bit of clearance. So it's a bit wider than perhaps ideal. You would perhaps want it sort of like down here like that. So, you know, you're talking about cutting off two or three millimetres here um, or getting pins that are a bit shorter. But, you know, they're nice and straight there. I've secured them, let's say, just on each side here. And I'll just go along, solder all the many points there. In theory, I could then trim these off here. Just leave the plastic bit, maybe, just to provide a bit of stability. And there we go. Behold, a pin tower. 
so yeah soldered on this side cleaned off the flux what I could do is uh, and I will do it afterwards trim all these down flat with the plastic and then it just makes it a bit more low profile on that side but that should now mean that this if we carefully align this should go on here I think Hey, there we go. So, that's not too bad. Yes, it sticks out a wing bit further than you might expect. But you know what? We've got enough clearance here, haven't we? Yeah, we've got a nice air gap. So I like that. And there's going to be plenty of space for that to fit here. If I land with that slot here, look. It's nowhere near that heat sink, so no problem. Anyway, let's just get that back off carefully without bending anything. Well, that's pretty stiff. That's it. I really should have the wrist strap on while I was handling that. Right, so uh, pin one, we've got the slant up here. The slant is up there. So, just inspecting the pins. Yeah, it's another reclaimed one because it's got bits of solder around it. Although it, it kind of looks brand new, so I don't know. So let's carefully align that with the socket. And press it in, wow that went in really low I am not sure it's making a connection even with the base and it's the similar thing with that so I don't know I'm envisaging problems with the MPEG side anyway the test thing there PRL check should test the MPEG side as well so let's connect this up again Can making sure to get it all aligned properly that's it you see, so that's like that it would totally block it wouldn't it but it's always going to be right hand slot and of course I could cut the pins down on this yeah just a little bit maybe two three four millimeters and just testing that it does work to show you yeah I missed capturing the first time so bear in mind the cache thing on the CPU is the first problem here with the WAV that'll make a stuttering noise as you can hear then the MP3 works fantastic well wow, I'm really pleased let's just, just use now actually let's do CPU switch the cache off helps if I can sight doesn't it PRL check yes so we should get the WAV and the MP3 now I am gonna get some new FIFOs I think just to rule out What is strange? <laughs> the MPEG sounds worse quality than the WAV. It's like the WAV sounds nice and clear, and the MPEG sounds like it's in a church cathedral or something, but it's got some echo applied to it. Or something, I don't know. It could just be it's a low quality MPEG because this executable is tiny in size. Sounds slower, doesn't it? That's what it does, it sounds slower. It's ironic, it's just higher quality <laughs> because it's MP3, that sounds less quality. Now I know all you Amiga gurus out there are going to go, are going to laugh and say, Gadget's whining about nothing here. But the amount of trauma I have suffered trying to get an MPEG player installed on here is ridiculous. I've got an older version of Amiga Amp. And it wouldn't work with a 536, and a message just pops up and disappears off the screen. It says a coprocessor is required. And that was after trying like 3.32, which is the suggested version. And that comes up saying window.class version 41 is required, which I think is an OS 4 thing. So you've got to upgrade all of your OS to OS 4 in order to get that version work. And I tried another version that needed a version of MUI. I eventually gave up with that, and then I put this one on. This needed MUI. And I spoke to Pillock and he was like, just put this version on 5 point whatever the demo version. I put that on and it then works, but I saw the, the message and it doesn't even stay on the screen. It just it appears and disappears straight away. So I was like, keep loading the app, keep loading the app, keep staring at the screen, staring at the screen, trying to see the error message. Code process required. So I swapped over from the 536. I guess this points out the, the need for an FPU. You know, Steven's like, nothing uses the FPU, you know, but some ridiculous design software seems to absolutely need it regardless of the fact we don't need an FPU prefs this did work previously so I could come in here hang on 
is down out. That now not working. No, it is. It's slow. And you've got MPEG two, MPEG three, and in the system bit over here, you've got engine MPEG it. Yeah. So I'd selected that, saved everything, and then it still said an FPU is required. Why is an FPU required for that? That's just nuts. So let's try it now. We've got a six triple eight two. Got one MP three on here. Look, one, no computer. Let's just try this. I'll put some YouTube ones on there so we don't get copyright issues. Let's see what happens now. Is it going to use the card? And the answer is yes, actually. Turn the volume up. Oh, wow. So, if I just uh, bring these speakers up here. It's coming through, the speakers. Fantastic. So I'm testing with headphones here for the ultimate test of quality. And you know what? It's absolutely crap. It really is. It is really bad. I can't emphasize how bad. I'm going to have to record this. I'll do a direct recording for you. And yeah, play them side by side. It's awful. I don't understand why. What? Where's the issue? There must be some issue in the design here. Oh my god, the pain, the pain, please help me. Trying to copy MP3s, so you think this would be a straightforward process. I've got the two drives, got the drives from my 4000 on the desktop here. I've got my MP3s, and I go to Depeche Mode, and I drag across here. And you think, what could go wrong? And error while copying Depeche Mode, not enough memory available. I think it seems to need to cache the whole thing or something. What's wrong with using the RAM you've got? And buffering bits of it and transferring the file that way. It's like, so I think we need more RAM than the size of the actual file. Remove the incomplete object, yeah we'll do that. How big are these? Is that like 6 meg, 7 meg, 4 meg, 7 meg, 10 meg, I don't know. So it's like how am I going to add? Zorro 2 now, remember. I think I'm going to have to swap back to the 5360 to give me 64 meg, copy the files across and then swap back. It's just hard to believe that something as simple as copying a file is a problem. It's like it's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. It's times like this I remember why I love Windows 10 so much. And that's saying something. I actually hate Windows 10 compared to Windows XP. We could max out the Zorro 2 to 8 meg, but I, I think it's going to struggle. I think we're going to not have enough RAM. That's what I think. So let's now connect the 53. Six back up. Oh, joy. I'll take the compact flash card out of there, stick it in here. The reason I'm trying to copy those with the MP3s is one or two of them may be a higher bit rate. I think that look mum no computer was like 64k or some at the bit rate, which I th think is low. I'm honestly, I can't remember now. It's not as high as it could be. It may just uh, sound a little bit better. You know, right, so. Interesting, we've got different colours on the desktop, this boot. Why the 536 gives us a different set of colours, I don't know. That, that's an interesting one, isn't it? These are like, like CGA style colours here, look. We didn't have that a minute ago. Only happy when it rains. Hey, it's not bad, that 536 performance on the ID though, is it? Turn of the Space Cowboy. <laughs> yeah, you can tell I've got quite a varied, uh, what's the word, type of music. I like all different types of music. But I like a lot of dance and 90s music, really, uh, and 80s, hence the, hence the Depeche Mode. Anyway, that's it. It's copied them all. Right, now we won't be able to play again because, and I'll show you this. Let me start a new ramp, watch. There you go. That's the message. Th thanks for that, software people, when you design this. You could at least keep the error message up just for a second. It says requires a math coprocessor. That's insane. Anyway, I'll stick the 2630 back in and we'll try again. Now I could be wrong, but it sounded kind of like Banjo Gali had just joined and put a tambourine backing track on there or something. You can hear the ch 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 ch. You know, sort of a clean beat, it's like it kind of like echoes out.
Right, so the MPEG audio is crap quality sounding at the moment. And on a hunch, I'm thinking the speed of this crystal's not right. It's not quite 14.318. It's 14.318 something, something, something. So, you may think, well, how's that problem? And because it's so minor difference. Well, it's about synchronisation, isn't it? And it's running faster, just marginally. And when you're looking at 13 point, what is it, 13 point, sorry, 14.318 million instructions per second, effectively, or cycles per second, maybe not that many instructions per second, but that many cycles per second, you get to your destination slightly faster than you expected. So when it comes to decoding MPEG, yeah, there's a chance that could actually be the problem. Yeah, so we'll stick it that way around like that. So what we are left with now is like that. If I'll bend them over and then they'll stay in the socket. There's no point there they're going to touch. What I can do now is just add some little wires, a little wire from there, around there, there, around there, a bit of cap to tape over there. Stick it on and we've got the best of both chips, both crystals. is just a test because we couldn't find, uh, Sparks couldn't find and I couldn't find the right crystals, you know, the right speed in the right package. There we go. <laughs> Let's give that a try, see if it's any different. So an hour or so scoping this last night, this is a one kilohertz sound wave. Now listen, it's like the stop and start bit. So it's not a continuous sign, and I'll show you on the scope in a minute. It looks absolutely terrible. This is 48 kilohertz, yeah, which is the low end of what this should support. And you can occasionally hear an artifact, like a blah, blah. Let's uh, start, blah. And I'll be honest, it kind of makes me think, looking at this board here, that it's all about lack of filtering, I and mean, it could just be, you know, two things, lack of filtering, but the components I've got here, I don't know. If we just have a look here, hang on, let's just do hit auto. Times 10 impedance here. Look, there's the waveform. Let me just do a capture, a stop. Can you see all this here? It's like some modulation, a ringing or something, you know, like harmonics or something. Let's just move the first cursor. And I'm not really sure where to stick it here. You know, you'd expect to, maybe it should just, let's just do the pulse. Let's just work out what this little pulse is here. I just muted that because it's driving me nuts. So yeah, if we measure the width of this single pulse here, bear in mind, they're not exactly the same, are they? Like you've got a little short one there, a big one there. Those are about spaced out about the same, maybe. If you look at the peaks here, here, here start to get narrower here so yeah 15 uh, kilohertz there but that's not going to be a full cycle is it but then again it comes straight back up here a little bit it may be though that it's on its downward swing at that point whatever the signal maybe is being picked up here crosstalk or whatever um yeah so i honestly don't know but what i do know is that looks absolutely terrible. Certainly this, this one here, you know, this uh, leading pulse, you know, leading edge. But just all the way along, it's like artifacty all the way, looks horrendous here. So this explains why it sounds so bad to me on mine. What's the problem though? I don't know. I spent an hour and a half last night scoping everything on here. And I was looking for, you know, well, I had the scope on different impedances just to see if there was any effect as well while I was listening to it the whole time with the test zone. So impedance changes from the scope probe made no differences anywhere. I added some additional capacitors here because looking at the uh, design, of, I think, for that chip there, the manufacturer recommended 10 microfarad and there's a 1. So I changed it to a 22. It made zero difference. I'm leaving the 22 there. It's better to have a bit more additional smoothing. I yeah, did an extra bit of capacitance up here for the main, you know, supply to the whole board there. But there's no inductors on here. There's very little in the way of 
filtering stuff. I think I was looking at the data sheet of one of these, it might be the main MPEG chip there, and it was suggesting you know, a 22 micro Henry inductor to supply the VCC. Well, they haven't done that with this. Is that the issue? Is my power supply the issue? The switch mode power supply? Why does everything else on that, the Prelude sound okay? Like WAV, for example, is crystal clear. So it's not like the IC up there. And I, I ruled out the coupling. I think I may have mentioned that earlier in this video. But I, I ruled out the coupling by feeding my own source directly in there. And it works all right. There's nothing wrong with like the line in that this uses on the Prelude. So... I don't know, I'm at an absolute loss. It could be any one of these components causing the issue here. We know it's not the crystal, because we've changed the crystal now for a different crystal, one that's nearer to, if not exactly, the frequency it's supposed to have. That made no difference. Component-wise, yeah, all of the passives around here are correct. I've double quadruple checked all the passives, no issues there. So we've either got a fault on one of these four ICs here, or a slow IC. Maybe the, the chip here, the Mac, is slower than it should be. Maybe it's marked dash 15. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's dash 20 or 25. And because we're getting, I don't know, some slow transition somewhere, we're getting a little bit of, what's the word, contention on some signal, which has given us this little pulse or something. Maybe it's a slow FIFO. I've ordered a new one of these, faster and larger, I'm not sure whether it'll work because it's larger, it's the same family, the same pin out and everything. In theory, you'd think I should just be able to remove it, put the other one in, it should work, because a FIFO is first in, first out. So it doesn't matter that it's twice as big, in theory. The data, you're just going to be just continuously clocking data through it. I doubt that ever even gets reset apart from the initial reset, you just continue to pass data through it. So one that's twice as big, shouldn't make any difference and it's faster so we'll try that and i've ordered some two new fifos for the actual main part of the prelude but as far as i can see the wav stuff gets passed through that as well and that's all right so i doubt it's those fifos on that board even though one of them was the wrong way around in part one that isn't the issue and swapping them around the behavior is exactly the same on this it's, and this only uses eight bits of a data you know the data bus yeah so if one of those fifos the one that feeds this was the, the one with the issue we'd know about it and um, yeah so there's no clues with this no clues at all other than to me this looks like maybe it's a board layout thing ground planes analog and digital ground planes it's all you know connected up here with no inductors or anything that's a possibility but then why some of the other guys saying it's actually all right i think pillock was the first he thought it was all right but he was tested eagle player thinking he was playing mp3 through this and he wasn't because eagle player doesn't use this eagle player goes through AHI, which is a WAV, you know, uses the WAV output. So you're not touching this card. And then Sparks UK said he had the problem and he put loaded a, an audio clip and it sounded exactly the same as mine, totally vibratory and awful. But then you speak to Stefan and he came to the conclusion that the MP3C he was testing with were too high a bit rate. It was like over 192K or something. And you, apparently you shouldn't go over 128 with these really, even though it's designed to do 196. Well, I look back at some of my MP3s and yes, one or two of them were a bit high, but not all of them. And I've gone back to testing the ones that aren't, that are 64K, 48K. These test samples you've been listening to here are 48K and it sounds terrible. It sounds like it's in a biscuit tin, there's vibration sort of... Uh, flavor to the sine wave you can see the sine wave looks awful so there's definitely some fault somewhere maybe i should swap that DAC next and then maybe swap that i don't know i haven't got spares though this is the thing so another day i've been looking at this over a few weeks actually not really doing masses on it but checking things scope and everything trying to work out the issue with the mpeg side anyway but two new chips arrived here fifo's gold top ones so these are really nice yeah, look at that. That's gorgeous, isn't it? It's like purple ceramic, gold pins, gold top. Yeah, I like those. Uh, but I think they're the same as these. These ones are manufactured by ST. The other ones are, is it IDT, I think, the other ones? Yeah, double checking those. That's correct. So, yeah, they look lovely, don't they, with that purple? Golden purple, very majestic. I'm just curious to see, does that make any difference at all to anything? Probably not. And in case you wonder what happens if you put a 16 megahertz crystal in there, it's faster. So I'm thinking this is about noise on this deck. There are a number of people who are going, I had that many problems with mine, mine sounds fine. 
one thing I've learned about audio over the years, and I am not an audiophile, is people are amazingly tolerant when it comes to sound. So what I mean is you can, you know, listen to your favourite track on this, and like I did, and go, oh, sounds great, sounds great. And then you put headphones on and you hear a shh, 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 with like the, uh, you know, like a beat noise that's supposed to be just a t t t t t goes shh, shh, shh. It's like you get an echoing on a specific frequency. And whilst this might not be the issue, I was looking at this DAC here, because this is what I think might be the issue, and the pinout for it, you've got VA and VL, so voltage for logic, voltage for audio. Now there's a reason why these are separate, yeah, because analog will interfere with digital, or digital rather, will interfere with analog. And what we seem to also hear is a bit of like noise on a frequency, and I showed you the scoping earlier, we've got these little lumps on top of things there. Like there's a clock somewhere getting into the DAC maybe, or here, was it outputs to the DAC, but then I wouldn't expect it to be on the waveform as, as it is when it's, I think it's on the DAC. But anyway, the analog and digital supply pins are joined on that chip. They go underneath the, you know, underneath it somewhere and just join up. No inductors, no capacitors, no separate routing of the rail there, you know, to cut out, you know, to, to see what I mean. There's nothing like that going on. So anyway, I'm going to lift that pin. It's the four from the right as we see it here. Pin one's top right, actually, up there. So, yeah, and I'll show you on the schematics in a minute. I'm going to lift it, bend it right up, and I'm just going to do some experimentation. I may go and get a little inductor. Uh, make a large dip, you know, a, a through hole one to start with and just try and join it up. Maybe something like twi 22 micro Henry. And just see if that makes any difference at all. I may even just route a tiny wire directly to over here to try and cut out. Because when you change the path there, you change how it can actually affect it. At least that's my understanding. I could be wrong. Yeah, so there's no noise now at all. Like none, no sound. You can see I removed it. Yeah, I set it on fire. <laughs> I uh, accidentally, when I was trying to separate the ground and the VCC, and I did that for a few different tests, and it was a bit better, but not much. And then I extended the ground around here, and I soldered where I thought was a ground on this capacitor, and it wasn't, it was VCC through a resistor. So I ended up with, well, 5 volts and 5 volts almost. Probably like 4.5 volts or something. And it, yeah, I saw a white cloud of smoke escape out of there. This still works, but obviously the MP3 is not doing anything. It's silent. So I've got some new DACs that arrived today. I wanted to swap the DAC out next anyway. I don't think this is going to make any difference. I actually think there's something with the driver, some of the software, or it's just bad. It was just, I don't know. It could be, oh God, I'll drop that on the floor now. I'll try to find that blooming thing. I mean, I guess the next thing to replace after this is maybe that i don't think it's that or the mac now i'm waiting for some macs those should arrive soon i need to see if i've got a way to program it because the tl866 won't do that chip Just the same, got the same rattles to it. Right, so I spent another couple of hours scoping the heck out of it and getting cheesed off of it. So I'm going to swap this chip. I do have a spare that I got from AliExpress of all places, so this is probably not going to prove anything. But I, said, I thought since I've got a spare here, let's give it a go. Yeah, that's not an ESD safe bag either. Right, let's get the hot air. I wish I'd caught my expression on camera, but it works, it works, it works, it's absolutely amazing. So it was that chip, that's what it was. I think that seller that Sparks bought the chip from, even though he said he was a really trusted seller, I think that guy has just bought a lot of this stock, thought it was all alright, and I think it's like failed quality control or something. But it does indeed work. If I actually play the test tone, and when I say the test tone, I mean like PRL check. Now on PRL check, we have got this cache issue but it's just on that program it's nothing else so i'll switch cache off and um, we'll do prl check i am so pleased i've spent two weeks of my life messing around with this mp module 
So everything there comes about the same. So the PCM stuff works fine as normal. Then the MPEG. So it's marginally slower, but it's crystal clear. Yeah, that is the key here. And if I go and open up the player now, it's hard to believe, it really is, because what you don't expect, you might expect one person to have a fault, and then, all right, you start looking at chips and things. But when everyone's got the same fault, you're like, maybe there's something wrong with the design, or maybe we've all got the same fault, and you don't expect the actual MPEG chip to be the thing, really. Well, I don't think so, anyway. It wasn't that obvious to me. It is, in, perhaps, in retrospect. If I play something like uh, the first few seconds of this, Normally, it would, you know, every time you get a ch 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 it would be very extended in uh, tone. It would, it would sound awful. Now it doesn't. That sounds clear. What was happening before, it was going... It was like a vibration sort of thing going on. And it's not doing that now. And it's the same if I play that Depeche Mode one. The main bass line there. There was like heavy distortion on that. It's not doing it, it's perfect, sorted. I am really pleased. I'll play you some copyright free MP3s on this and I'll do some direct captures and you can hear what it sounds like. And whilst it might not be, you know, audio file quality in terms of, uh, you know, noise ratio, you know, signal to noise ratio, it's pretty damn good actually with headphones on. I'm very impressed with it. Yeah, just playing a bit of Depeche Mode there, let me just mute that before I get a copyright strike. In the settings for Amiga MP, I changed the prefs to use the system font, it's just a lot more readable. The stuff down here is a bit small, it's like 44 kilohertz. that is supposed to say 192. This is the thing, I think it's designed and optimised maybe for ECS upwards, you know, we've got 16 colours on the desktop here, can't get any more colours unless I add an ECS Denise. Um, CPU usage, you can see, you know, less than 10%. Uh, and you can get that even better. Uh, when I was changing, and I'll show you this, I'll just shut this down. You can change a few settings in here. You can get rid of the skin stuff, and then obviously it's a lot more visible. I mean, I can show you that actually if I choose don't use a skin. I'll save that in a second. Um, the only other setting I just switched off here was limit volume to zero decibels there. And here, yeah, you can change loading as file, and it loads the whole file in, but bear in mind, that can take quite a while. Like, that file was just playing the Depeche Mode one, there's like 7 meg. So it does take, I don't know, 15 seconds or more to load in. And then the other thing I changed, when I had that CPU monitor there, showing the percentage, it would freeze after about a second and just stop playing. And I have to start playing again, it play a second, and then it would stop. And it was the priority. I've just set these right down to the lowest priority of zero for the main and the playback. Visualization, I'm not bothered about. I don't want that to eat CPU cycles. And if I click save now, the net results now you'll see there's no skin. And I would leave it this way on this setup if it had the repeat button, but it doesn't. You can see everything loads here. You've got the playlist, and it's old school, you know, using the original controls perhaps. Uh, yeah, I would leave it like this, uh, you know, and be happy with that. And the equalizer works as well, by the way. Yeah, if I press play here, you can see all the information really clearly now. Yeah, 41.1, it's layer 3, 320 kilobits per second. I'm guessing it's going to drop some of that out, because I think it's limited to something like 192k bits per second. But when I've used headphones to listen to it, it's pretty blooming good, to be honest. It maybe lacks a bit of the low frequency stuff it's got more you know it seems more high frequency based so i'm not sure if that's what happens you know it's gonna it must be dropping a certain amount of data but you don't hear any stutters any crackles any noise or anything so that works really well and the priorities i changed before mean that you can now do things like this if i oh hang on it stopped yeah and i think i can't do that for very long now because the file is not cache very much. You've got 256k of the file cached. I'll just unpause that. Start it maybe from midway. Let's just try that again. Let's just see how long it lasts. Right, so I'll start to move it. Yeah, about two or three seconds at best. But if I stop that, we go back into prefs. 
and we'll change that to the whole file as file and we'll click save. If I load that now that's going to load the whole file. Uh, let's tell it, load the world to free one again. Make sure I load the mp3. So you can see it's saying opening file. There is a chance this is not freeing things up. Oh, there we go, it's loaded. So that did take about 20 odd seconds, didn't it? Or 30 seconds to load. But if I hit play now, and you can hear it's still playing while I'm doing all this. Before, this would have stopped if I hadn't changed the priority to zero. The probably still need to be zero, but it needs to be fairly low. And whilst that's playing, if I move this around now, it just keeps playing, yeah? And likewise, I think, if I move this around, it keeps playing because it's now all in RAM yeah so I think that that's the way I would roll it's a shame there aren't any options other than 256k and then the next step up is the whole file if I was going to do it I think I'd add you know I don't know half a meg, one meg, two meg, four meg, eight meg or you know I maybe after four meg then put the whole file um, because then you could you know sacrifice some memory for use with it but not have to wait for the whole thing to load in if that makes sense and then a good buffer of say 4 meg that would be a, maybe a good halfway medium wouldn't it be a good balance of everything not waiting long for it to load and being able to move things around without it stopping but yeah that works really well and if I go into the equaliser yeah that's the left right balance I think and that's the overall volume there you go should have had it a bit louder there shouldn't it You can hear the high frequency come up there. High frequency down. When it's a high frequency, that's like 16 kilohertz or something like that, I think. And if we increase the bass. Yeah, you can hear that. Working. Fantastic. I really like it. Let's try the left, right. Yeah, you can't hear that, but trust me, that is working. So yeah, anyway, coming back to the CPU thing, so you can see less than 10%, average is about 7 or 8% there, when you've cached the whole file. So that's perhaps the best way to, to use this, I would suggest. And of course, it just frees you up to use your system for other things. Now here's the thing, what can you actually do before it stops? So then now let's try on sysinfo. Let's try a drive speed test. Because in theory, it shouldn't be using the drive, should it? There you go, 3.8 meg. Yeah, that's not coming up as, as fast as usual because some of the CPU there for the TF3, uh, the TF5 360IDE is being used by, by the uh, two things: the you know the MP3 spooling the data, yeah, to the MP3, but also that progress bar, you know, the not progress bar, but the CPU performance indicator. So normally that would be about 4.5, 4.7 meg. But it's working power, well, it hasn't stopped it, has it? The buffer is big enough, and there's enough CPU available, you know, so you, there are certain things you'll be able to do in parallel to that without an issue. This is with everything maxed out volume-wise. Yeah, so short clip there that I tested it with, 22 kilohertz. It's awful. I think the recorder on this is not great at all, to be honest. Yeah, so what I'm going to do now is trim down these pins here flat with that black plastic. I'll show you that. I can use the black plastic as the guide here. And, ah, yeah, pretty stiff to cut through that. Yeah, there we go. So looking really nice with those gold top FIFOs, isn't it? And it's got the... I think it's a 1 meg FIFO here instead of a 512k and then I did just you know trim all these down here one or two of them look a bit brassy but they're all nice and smooth and totally square it just looks a bit better than protruding quite a lot there but nevertheless anyway, it's going to go into this position here yeah so this is the V1 of the SID card there'll be a link top right to that video yeah it works through the pass through here but there is something pretty cool about using an actual SID chip. Alright, I'm using a Nano Swin SID, but at some point I might get an actual SID. 
yeah, so I need to lower that volume a little bit on the SID card because it's a bit loud. You know, it's louder than any of the other inputs here by about mm, 60%, I reckon. And you know what, the Amiga audio is amazing, but just listen to this SID card again now. I'm just like sat here stuck listening to some Ben Dalglish, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. He was such an amazing musician. But yeah, the SID, it could just push out some sounds that, yeah, you can sort of recreate them with something like the, well, you can very well with a prelude. And certainly Paula was sort of up to the job, really. But there's just something about the frequency changes and things that don't get captured very well when you try and translate that to, you know, something that needs PCM, it needs spoon feeding with a similar sort of interpretation of the shape of the signals. It just sounds sharper and clearer and all the rest of it. And the filtering's a lot better. And incidentally, that's the point, if you join a SID card up to something like this, you can't use, in Delitrack, you can't use the filter of the Amiga. If you join it up to the infernal serial connector audio input pin down there, as I showed, it goes to one of the resistors actually is the best place to feed it. Then you can switch the filter of the Amiga off and on, and the sound will pass through the filter. And it sounds very much like a, you know, additional sort of SID filtering at that point. It's really good. It's really good. I did file this, you know, sand this down. Uh, just to get rid of any little burrs and things, and obviously it's left it a little bit scuffed on the surface. I'm just going to spray this with some black acrylic paint, actually. Yeah, so at this point here I used AHI Record, thanks to Glenn over at CLG for suggesting that one. I had to make sure I muted any of the channels that I didn't want to record from, just to get rid of the noise in the background. And increase the sort of preamp section there in this software, you know, max it out so that it max the input volume. And whilst the quality is alright, as you'll hear in a second, it sounds a bit muffled. Sort of lever out the engine a little bit. You should be able to do it in theory. There we are. Pull that right. So when you read from RAM, well, to start with, this is not initialized, is it? So you need some way of keeping track of whether you've actually got. And after a spray, you can see that looks pretty good. Yeah, there's still some little streaks you could do with another coat, but that looks excellent. If you look at the underside, you can see, you know, it had those little ring marks there from the 3D print, whereas you don't have those very noticeable here. There are some imperfections, but I think I'll just give it another coat. That will come out good as new. And then, you know, at some point later, I'll fit it on here, but right now it's not going into a machine. It will probably go into my 2000. So a massive thanks to Stefan for programming up the chips, Sparks UK for gathering all of the parts, the boards, doing a you know an order himself for all the people in my Discord there. Um, and I think he's, like as I said in part one, he's built some of these, so they'll probably appear on eBay. It looks really nice with the gold top chips there. I'm glad I got those. They were a bit expensive, they're like £10 each, like £20 for a pair of FIFOs. I bet if you get the ST ones, probably about four or five pounds each, if that. Um, we still don't have the correct size crystal here, but the right frequency. Yeah, so for the moment I've got that socket. Um, you, I'll show you a clip actually just now before I wrap this up. Seriously losing the will to live work on this MP3 player. It's just suddenly started going at like a ridiculous speed. As you can hear, I have power cycle there, check the power connection, something has failed. Yeah, you notice how the sound was going absolutely crazy. It was that crystal. One pin was a bit loose in that socket. That's why using sockets with crystals is never really a good idea. Yeah, and we got the larger FIFO in there. That may help with buffer underrun, but I suspect that the software would need to be updated to deal with that. But in the rare circumstance where the software glitches a little bit or the time and an edge of a signal somewhere is not quite right, if it's feeding as fast as it possibly can do into that FIFO, in theory, the FIFO may be able to make use of the buffer being slightly larger, but I bet there's a relationship to the software. Um, but you could use the 1 meg FIFO rather than the 512k FIFO. I think, I think those are the size of those uh, FIFOs. In terms of getting rid of the noise, you know, the signal to noise stuff, one of the issues I did notice throughout all of the testing here, and I haven't resolved it still in this, is when you're listening to the MP3, certainly recording, uh, you know, on, or using headphones, you do get a bit of noise in the background, and as soon as you mute some of the other inputs on here, that problem goes away. I think it's one particular input. I'm guessing it's this. So that, in my case here, could have been the SID card introducing that, but I'm sure when I did recordings earlier on, I didn't have anything connected up here, and I still had the noise. As soon as you mute 
the the channel that goes there and in fact that might really relate to this so i could be talking rubbish whichever one of these i muted and i muted everything apart from the one that was connected to the you know it was playing at mp3 the signal to noise stuff improved there was no noise in the background at all it could be the mic check out glenn's channel below he's done a little bit more testing and he may do more in his follow-up video as well he's used scum vm i couldn't get that running on here the reason being is this 030 is nowhere near fast enough to run even the ecs version of scum vm there'll be another video where i had all sorts of problems trying to get an ecs denise run on this board to test scum vm ecs but it was so, so, so slow. I kid you not. It's like, it's just unplayable. Absolutely unplayable. Even the sound. I couldn't demonstrate the sound because it would play for a second or two and then stop. Play for a second or two and then stop. So if you're going to use something like Scum VM to output its audio to AHI, yeah, you really need an 040 or an 060. So you never know. Watch this space. At some point, Stephen Leary may get a chance to finish his 2040. We may be able to get a, an 040 and then we can revisit that with Scum VM. Yeah, so what else? We covered the thing about noise, you mute your channels you don't want to use. Uh, and what could cause that? Well, if you look at the traces here for the audio, they go all the way up here in parallel, you know, with some of the digital signals and things. So, you know, is this four layer? I bet it's not. I bet it's a two layer. So, you know, that could be improved. Yeah, you could, you know, I don't know, separate, cut the traces, separate, cut them at the other end as well and join up with shielded cables and things like that. That might get rid of some of the, the, the signal to noise stuff. Um, and the chip here, could that be improved? Could the circuit around it be improved? Because I know Glenn tested with the microphone. Whilst it's fairly clear, it feels a bit muffled. It sounds a bit muffled, like the high frequency stuff is, is filtered out. You know, you get more of the, you know, low to mid range. The high frequency stuff seems filtered. So, uh, you know, and that's on the line in. That's not even using this, which is for the mic, I think. That might be the top one. I'm not honestly sure. Yeah, so it's not perfect. It could perhaps be revised. You know, I mentioned earlier about the audio uh, section here, you know, the analog and digital uh, sections, you know, the supply rails joined up there. That could be improved as well. And of course, you really don't want big long connectors like that, although it didn't make much of a difference. And you saw when I was testing it on the table here, I had an IDC cable, you know, a male to female there, and I had it, you know, connected there and the ribbon coming down. It was working all right. So in theory, you could locate that somewhere else in your machine, but you want the cable to be as short as possible, really. Yes, it's a digital interface but you can get issues you know clocks could just glitch a little bit data signals can glitch a little bit and you may find it's not quite as good quality if you have that at a distance yeah anyway i do hope you found the video interesting please like share and subscribe i hope you have a good christmas because i'm filming this bit just before christmas yeah so have a good uh, new year and stuff as well i'll get some more videos up over christmas maybe the other live stream can't thank you enough uh, seriously things like this i wouldn't have been able to build without all of the support i get from everyone that watches the channel thumbs up the channel and everyone that provides you know some level of support to the channel anyway wishing you all the best have a good christmas happy new year i'll catch you in the next video